Let me start by welcoming you. Welcome to our webinar today, all about B2B cognitive marketing, where we'll be discussing segmentation, emotion and decision. Um, for any people that don't know me, my name's Miriam Draman. I'm CEO at BCM Agency. We are a specialist B2B marketing communications agency taking a cognitive approach to B2B marketing and it's all about understanding the customer better which we'll be discussing shortly. I'm joined today by my colleagues Sarah Stephen who heads up Insight and Client Services here for BCM, our non-exec director Tim Hazelhurst and also Professor Benedetto De Martino specializing in cognitive neuroscience at UCL who you'll all hear from shortly. If we have a quick look at the agenda for today, the session will last roughly an hour. Um, we'll leave time for questions at the end, so please do feel free to add anything into the chat as we go along. I know we've had at least one question already come through via, via email, which is great. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let me introduce our non-exec director, Tim Hazelhurst, um, so you can introduce yourself, Tim. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Miriam. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, I'm Tim Hazelhurst, and I've been in love with and working in B2B marketing communications for 60 years now. And back in 1973, I founded IAS, which is now Stan IAS. And in those days, there were two challenges facing me, both running in parallel. To grow IAS and to differentiate B2B from the dominant B2C at that time. And of course, the former was dependent on the latter. So by 1983, a small group of us had created what was then known as ABBA, the Association of Business to Business Agencies, which has now morphed into uh, the Business Marketing Club, um, I believe. And also, IS had grown to uh, 100 people by 1983. So both were, uh, were on, on course, so as to say. I also created um, an Anglo-American um, B2B marketing um, enterprise, which was known as Britam. And um, that was successful over the next seven years because the pound and the dollar reached parity, which created an opportunity which might sound familiar at this moment in time. <laughs> I also joined up um, business to business enthusiasts, firstly in Europe and then around the world, by creating BBM, the business to business network. Um, and now I'm helping Miriam wherever I can and her talented team at uh, BCM. But there's no room for complacency. So let's move on to the seven core principles slide. Many years ago, I determined these seven principles, which whilst technology has advanced considerably, they're still immensely pertinent. And I thought it worthwhile taking you through them. Um, they're not in any order of importance because they're all important. So let's start with... Um, process efficiency. As aspects of technology change, often quite rapidly, they become fashionable and there is a desire to embrace them. Now, knowledgeable use of technology can maximize your process efficiency as an agency, both internally and externally. As a client, by improving your marketing productivity. However, quantitative emphasis and fashionable usage can damage your brand. Remember that. Cognitive marketing is the, qualita the qualitative route to enabling maximum marketing productivity through in-depth relationships enabled with that optimum process efficiency. But always remember that the technology is the enabler, not the answer. Principle number two is the four Cs. Um, back in about 1960, a guy called Phil Kotler came up with the four uh, P's to uh, support uh, B2C marketing. And back in 1980, a very good colleague and mentor of mine back in those days, Professor 
Bob Lauterborn from uh, Dur Dur Durham Raleigh University in South Carolina. He came up with the uh, four C's. So in business to business, we don't talk about product. We talk about the customer's wants and needs. We don't talk about price. We talk about the cost to satisfy those wants and needs. We don't talk about place. We talk about convenience to buy. And we don't talk about promotion. We talk about communicating with. Seems obvious now, but it was so important to differentiate B2B back then, and it still is. So principle number three is relevance. The successful brands are those that know their customers and prospects better than their competitors, better than anyone else. And for complex decision-making units, this requires careful planning based on meaningful research. And Pareto, the 80-20 rule, determines that only 20% really do it well. Principle four, the relationship timeline. Every prospect is on a timeline, moving from unaware to aware, from aware to interested, from interested to trialing, to trialing to being a regular customer, and then hopefully from being a customer to being an advocate. Call it the buyer journey, call it whatever you want, but most of the marketeers, the 80%, don't do it terribly well. That's why I constantly get emails from sellers who address me as a prospect for irrelevant products and services. And one thing that frightened me to death, I used to drive Jaguars all the time. And uh, I'd had them for about 15 years when I got a, a, a direct mail letter from Jaguar in Browns Lane Coventry saying, why don't you buy a Jaguar? It destroyed the brand in my mind. So when you are a customer, segmentation is going to be sacrosanct to preserve it. So principle number five is creativity. An average business to business relationship timeline is one to two years long. And relevant and brilliant creativity will shorten that timeline and give you a severe advantage over your competitors. And principle number six is brand strength. The brand to demand debate rages but the in-depth research that I conducted back then proved conclusively that the ability to attract and convert inquiries is directly proportional to your brand strength. Brand strength that is both qualitative and quantitative. Investment in brand strength through a cognitive approach will increase your marketing productivity. And finally, principle number seven, as I said, I'm a firm believer in Pareto, the 80-20 rule. And only 20% of companies were doing it 100% right back in my day. The sales and marketing relationship has changed considerably with the digital world. But I would look out for the sales and marketing disconnect. It's often there, so beware. And now we look at the segmentation slide. So in a way, this is back to rule number six. The brands that succeed are the ones who know their customers and prospects better than their competitors. But segmentation demands knowledge, hence the need for research and constant updating. Segmentation is about a relationship with a maintenance engineer in Germany, in the aircraft manufacturing sector, who is aware of your brand and products, but not a current user of them, and has previously expressed interest in a particular product and will hopefully move along the timeline. And add psychographic, cognitive knowledge and your marketing productivity will accelerate. Back in the 80s, I used a contact creed and permission-based marketing, which combined segmentation with relationship building to move those relevant decision-making unit members down the timeline. Superb and relevant creativity would accelerate this movement. The relationship is the crucial factor and it must be segmented, targeted, relevant and timely and ideally desired by the prospect. 
because it is useful and relevant to them. And as I said earlier, nothing really changes. Back in the 70s and 80s, decision makers were swamped with quantitative direct or junk mail and telephone calls, just as I am now swamped with the relevant digital contact that does not address me as a retired B2B agency owner. Uh, as a quick glance at my uh, LinkedIn profile would reveal, but as a potential customer for all sorts of irrelevant services. Every one of those prospectors destroys their brand in my mind. And remember that your brand, everybody's brand, is the perception in the minds of your customers and prospects of your values and benefits. Thank you and back to Miriam. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, let's have a little look at the decision-making unit. So. As Tim mentioned, to get a customer from unaware through to purchasing from you, you've got to first ensure that you are actually communicating with the right person. And this is where the true complexity of B2B lies in the first instance. So decision-making units or DMUs today, they are made up of, on average, seven people. That's seven people that you've not only got to identify, but actually understand on a granular enough level to have a decent conversation with them. You know, whether that's via email, by telephone, via social media platforms or LinkedIn messaging, for example, the tactics at that point are actually irrelevant. Strategy is key. Um, we've seen, for example, the rise of ABM, account based marketing, and we understand that we've got to communicate with more than one contact in any given any given organization. But at BCM, we'd actually argue that account-based marketing or ABM is simply doing B2B marketing properly. And that is ultimately cognitive marketing. If we take a look at what the future of B2B marketing looks like, I'd argue it is in a state of flux right now. We have got global issues going on. Um, we've got a war, energy price hikes, inflation, not to mention COVID and the pandemic that we've all just been through. And quite genuinely, it's tough out there right now. So the focus has really got to be on marketing productivity, i.e. doing less with more, or doing more with less even, sorry. Um, and, and that means working smarter. So all of this is happening against the digital landscape with each touch point on that prospect and customer journey invariably having a digital dimension to it now. Sadly, the digital world isn't split by B2B and B2C. So um, we've got B2B back in a position where it's fighting for differentiation, but using the same channels and media as its B2C counterpart. But all the decades of hard work that we've heard Tim discuss, um, all, the, all the work that was done to elevate B2B marketing as a function, they haven't been wasted. What we need to do is apply the rules of B2B marketing correctly. And this is what cognitive marketing allows you to do. So what is cognitive marketing? Simply put, cognitive marketing is doing B2B marketing properly. So we'll hear shortly from Professor Benedetto, but as he says here on the slide that you can see, understanding how buyers behave and what and why they buy, their cognitive bias, is critical to understand decision making. It, it is ultimately the holy grail for B2B marketers out there everywhere, but it's about understanding the customer better than your competition understands them. So communicating using tone and language that will engage with those prospects, that speaks to their pain points and their challenges, and that ultimately sets your company aside from the rest consistently. The big question is, will it work for B2B? Um, we're not here today to tell you that cognitive marketing is something new. It is not a new concept. It has been used in the B2C arena for, for many, many years. However, traditionally, B2B buying has been regarded as rational, not triggered by emotion. It's been all about needs, not wants. And that was always the differentiator between B2B and B2C marketing. But we can categorically tell you that B2B is about wants as well as needs. In fact, I'd say the need is often a given, but it's tapping into the want. That's how you as an organization can gain true competitive or as we call it, cognitive advantage. 
cognitive marketing really can be a game changer for B2B. Humans ultimately are not rational. So behavioral economics proves that whilst we may believe that we think and we act rationally, and we'd all like to, to believe that, we are actually driven by naturally occurring cognitive biases, even when it comes to business decision making. To understand a little bit more about this and the human brain and cognitive behaviours and, and really get behind the science of it all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Benedetto De Martino. As mentioned, he's a professor of cognitive neuroscience at UCL and Benedetto actually consults with BCM on the scientific elements of cognitive marketing. So I'll pass across to you, Benedetto. Thank you. Hello, Miriam. Hi. Thanks. Um, hope everybody can hear me fine. So as Miriam said, I work at UCL and I've led for many years a group that is interested in studying uh, human decision making. So in my lab, we are very much concerned of which are the neural basis of this decision making. And historically, most of my work has been in the footstep of my mentor, that is uh, Professor Daniel Kahneman, that in the 70s, together with Amos Tversky, he started to challenge this assumption that decisions are driven by logic only and exclude things like emotion or other sort of cognitive bias that are so important. Um, my work has extended on that um, by looking at what are the neural basis of this phenomenon. But before doing that, I want to start to introduce you to some basic concept that I think is very important to take in mind when we think about decision. So next slide. So when I actually, when I arrived in this country during my PhD, I often heard the expression, oh, but that's not possible. It's like comparing apple and oranges. And to me, it sounded always striking me a bit strange as a phrase, because if you think about compelling apple and orange is what we do all the time. You won't be able to buy your dinner at the supermarket if you are unable to decide if you wanted to buy a bag of apple on a bag of oranges. And the reason I think this uh, phrase comes from is that the fact that people tend to um, conflate the two very different types of decision. The one other, the, 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 when we are looking at decision making, we often in the field divide them in perceptual and value based choice. Now, perceptual choice, like the one at the bottom, that ask you which line is longer, is clearly required that the, the unit must be the same, right? I can't compare the length of a line against the length of a sonata of a back. So I need that they, they are in the same dimension. But these are not actually the decision that we often do and the decision that concern you as people involved in marketing or an economic decision. Those other type of decision are called value-based decision. And by definition, are done between things that are very different at the perceptual level. In fact, we can even, you know, like calculate insurance company, they even calculated the value of a human life. So things can be compared in this new space where these operation happen. And with my group, we have been trying to understand how the brain performs this computation and what is the role of this, of a bias in this type of computation. Next slide. So just to recapitulate, the perceptual choice, like comparing two lines, are based on sensory input. You do a categorization for the reason I say the sensory input have to be in the same dimension for you to do these things, and then you make an action. Value-based choice are way more complicated. First of all, they are able to deal with sensory input. They are very, very different. As we say, a banana looks very different from an apple. You can even choose between money and going, you know, tonight I'm going to, to listen opera and I've been trading money with music. So the sensory input can be very different. But there is a, a very important thing about um, value-based choice they are much more than perceptual choice shaped by other factors. And those factors are your memories, are your goal, your internal state. Some things can be very appealing in a certain state and, and not very appealing in another one. And all these things have a, such a powerful effect in shaping what you think is valuable, not valuable. I wanted to give you an example with that. Just can we go to the next slide? So, Look for a second to this painting and trying to guess 
uh, trying to ask yourself uh, how valuable is this painting? First of all, start to think about how much would you like to have this painting in the house? Is, is an image that you like? Maybe some people would like this scene of a mother and a son hugging in the in a field. Some people might not like that type of style. But then ask yourself another question. Would you think that this is going to be a valuable uh, item to sell on eBay? So if I put this painting on e in eBay, would, independently of how much I like, because this is also another aspect of value, it's something shared across uh, so social interaction. So I might not like some things, but believe the other people might like that type of art. So maybe you may think maybe it's a bit amateurish. Maybe I won't make it much money by selling this painting. Or maybe you think it's going to be a valuable painting. Now, I don't have you in the room to get your hands up and ask how much of you like or don't like. But I can ask you another question now. Do you know who painted this one? Because probably most of you don't know, and I'm going to reveal it to you now, who painted this painting next to the light. So this one was painted by the young Adolf Hitler. Um, let's go back on the other painting, because this is a very disturbing image, and I want to talk over it. <laughs> but I use this example to tell you. Now I give you this little bit of information, and these things has completely remapped your value. Maybe if you thought it was lovely and, you know, cute, maybe now you feel a bit ashamed of that or maybe you're just trying to see or maybe actually wasn't so nice but also if you believe that this is a cheap painting that it won't sell anywhere on ebay now you know that this has quite a lot of value because there is a lot of people in our world and unfortunately like to collect these uh, uh, this type of uh, artifacts yes. um just let's move to slides so this was a good example that value is often constructed and is constructed in our mind in so many factors. You know, a lot of the bias that uh, um, Sarah is going to tell you later and things, they will come from the fact that we do not make decision in isolation. We don't make a decision in a complete vacuum. We make a decision in a context. And uh, in order to, I want to just give you a, another little bit of information about what we know now about how the brain constructed this value. In the past, we used to think that the value was just one thing. So, you know, economists call this thing a utility. And somehow your brain is able to compute this one value for everything. By studying of neuroscience and studying animal behavior and so on, because remember, our brain have not developed to do trading on a financial market. They have not developed to do marketing. They have developed to survive in an environment. We now know and understand that the, the, the value system are multiple. So just a, a quick schematic. The first type of value system we are talking about is a Pavlovian value system. Now, the name might sound a bit confusing, but think about an extreme automatic value system in which you do not need to learn. So evolution has thought that some things is not worth, is too risky to learn in your life. So it's kind of sculpted those value in your genes. Now, this is going to be important later on, but just to give you an idea of a Pavlovian value, a small baby doesn't need to learn the milk is valuable. He knows it. it has been already hardwired in his gene. A person doesn't need to know that jumping from a win window has a low value. This is going to be hardwired in their genes because, as you can imagine, given the, the risk of this action, you won't be able to survive to learn those things. Now, those values are useful. They save your life, but they also very rigid, right? They have been sculpted by, by you know, thousands of years of evolution, and there is very little you can do about them. However, uh, the brain, in particular, a more complex brain, started to develop a more sophisticated system. The one we talk in the middle, sometimes called a bit, well, sometimes called model-free system, is the system that uh, in mind doesn't need to have these hardwired connection between food and value, for example, but you can associate. You can associate that if I see a log of a restaurant, I'm gonna get food. So the log of the restaurant on its, itself had no value, but after association, 
you can now transfer the value of the food, the value of the things to some things that didn't have value. So as you can see, this system is already more flexible, can learn a new value. It can also remap those value because if after several time I go to that restaurant and I got food poisoning, I won't go, the value of the things is gonna go down. Actually, you can become even aversive to it. Now, this system is powerful and think about the most of the advance that we are witnessing in artificial intelligence like AlphaGo, DeepMind and so on are based on a sophisticated version of this system. But the human brain has an even more sophisticated system and this is the goal-directed system. The goal-directed system is a system that can actually learn and again, we also names are quite funny, but we also like to call this a system model-based system, but we use this word because it makes little sense if you don't know where it comes from the name. But the idea is that this system learned the model of the world. So this system doesn't learn a simple association, but it, it constructs much, and this is a system we often use. Now, this system, you will say, okay, why we don't use that all the time? This system takes time to train, takes a life to a children to learn connection. You know, my daughter is 12, she still doesn't understand how all society works together and so on. So it takes almost like 20 years and we're still learning how this world works and takes time to update it. And these are very demanding as a system. Uh, so you consume a lot of our resources. What is important for you though, the take home message that this system not always give you the same answer. Sometimes these system are conflicting and a lot of bias we see comes because of this conflict between this parent system. Let me give you one quick example. So one effect I studied very profusely during my career is framing effect. This is the fact that if I tell you the same information on the two different frames, your behavior will change dramatically. So let's say you're on a diet, you see a yogurt and you see 95% fat free, you think, okay, that's a good yogurt, I'll buy on a diet. And then if it was actually marketed as a 5% full fat, you might not wanna buy it. Now you know that is the same amount of fat. So your goal-directed system is able to compute they are equivalent, but there is your Pavlovian system that is still in place, is still working. And his work now is going against it. His working is like, approach something good and avoid something bad. So if fat is bad for me, I'll avoid it. You know, it's like the same reason why it takes a long time to relearn association that goes against the intuitive things. So there is a there is a famous experiment that they often Kahneman used to mention to me that uh, people are just looking a word on a screen and when the word was a positive word, like puppy or something, they were holding a lever in their hands. They weren't asked to do anything. But when it was a nice word, the hands was going towards it a bit in a way that they couldn't even realize it was. And sometimes they were like actually words like vomit or bear. Sorry, the, the other way around. So when the word was appealing, people were moving towards that. And when it was a, a negative word that they were just pushing it away. So there is this automatic pull and push system that evolution has given to us for good reason, but constantly might interact with them. Now, just to conclude my brief talk, it's important to understand that the brain has this limitation. And you know, often I, I often argue about the term bias because the term bias has this very negative connotation. And is negative if you look through a lens of pure, pure logic and rationality. But as we said, the human brain has evolved to, to survive a complex environment. And some of these so-called bias make sense. So we are social animals, for example, and context is very important. The tone in which I'm saying the same content may completely change your understanding of what I'm saying. So the fact that the human brain process this thing is not wrong, but now it's some things that can either work against you or can work in your favor. And sometimes intuitively people have also learned how to capitalize on that. What could be good would be to understand what the science behind this and to understand how this system may work together or works against it. And researchers prove that the more knowledge you have about yourself, bigger ability of introspection of yourself, 
and big ability to admit that there are limitations in your thinking can then help you to put some mechanism to overcome this limitation. Ignoring is definitely not the solution because it just on either side, on the sides of who is tr trying to like marketing some things and to the side of the consumer. And with this, I think my brief presentation has finished. Uh, I'll pass some um, to Sarah. Thanks, Benedetto. Um, really interesting stuff, actually. And as you said there, the role that bias plays in decision making really cannot be underestimated. Um, as Miriam referred to earlier as well, it's assumed that humans are rational, um, but this is strictly not true. So the behavioural economics that Benedetto has just discussed proves that while we may believe we do act and think rationally, we're actually driven very much by these naturally occurring biases, especially in the case of business decision making. 95% um, sorry, of purchase decision making is actually taking place in our subconscious minds. So by leveraging these irrational aspects that we may be not aware of, us as B2B marketers can achieve huge marketing gains. Now, there are three um, of the most common cognitive biases are prejudicial, contextual and experiential. So let's have a look at each of those in a little bit more detail. Prejudicial bias is where we stick with what and who we know, even if it isn't the best solution for our needs. So if you think about yourselves, how many of us continue to use a brand just because we always have done? It's something that we feel in our comfort zone with. But by knowing that our decision makers will be driven by this bias, it allows us to use this to our advantage as marketers. We can tailor our communications that directly appeal to that individual's wants and needs that will break this inertia and complacency and therefore encourage them to switch brands. A common example that we could look at is Apple versus Samsung. Apple iPhones were introduced back in 2007 quickly took the world by storm. They left Samsung standing. They still had flip phones at that point, not sort of smartphones. Yet over the past 15 years, what Samsung have done, they've invested massively into their marketing. And they've actually moved from a very product benefit approach to their marketing to a much more storytelling approach. So they're engaging with consumers on both the rational and the irrational and the emotional level, which actually has resulted in Samsung leapfrogging Apple and they've held the top market position for the last nine years in terms of smartphone sales. So it just goes to show how understanding those differences can make a really, really big impact to people's businesses. Contextual bias, as the name suggests, is all about the context of your communication. So how you say something is actually almost as important, if not more so, than what you're actually saying. Benedetto made reference to it there within terms of the yogurt, in terms of the 5% fat. So another example is if someone had developed a new medicine and only two out of 100 people suffered side effects, is it better for that company to market it as only 2% of people will suffer side effects? Or is it better to market it that in no, there are no side effects in 98% of people? And just these simple differences can make a real difference. And by resonating the information with your audience in the correct way, um, you'll greatly influence their decision making. And by getting it right, which you can only do by truly understanding that individual customer, can you engage with them more effectively and move that decision making process into your favour. Experiential bias, this is where we make a judgment based on the most extreme point of an experience, and that can be good or bad. So imagine you've been working with an IT provider for many years, they provide an excellent service, you've had no problems, but one day your systems go down, they crash, and they don't rectify it quickly, and that causes you a lot of knock-on problems. That one single experience can cloud your judgment of the whole service provided by that company, and those years of goodwill can be doubted and in some cases lost. Again, for us as marketers, knowing that everyone is driven by this bias it gives us an opportunity to ensure that good experiences are achieved throughout the entire customer journey that Tim referred to earlier. By correctly identifying all the different touch points of that journey, ensuring positive experiences at each one significantly increases the chances of customers choosing you over a competitor. Another example a friend gave me actually about this, which is all to do with experiential bias, is with um, an airline company. Unfortunately, my friend was abroad and her father died and she had to get home. The airline company offered her an open-ended ticket. They were incredibly helpful. And that one experience, which was about 20 years ago, means that she will not hear a bad word said about that airline company ever again. So it just goes to show the power that can be had by this. 
Framing, which Benedetto referred to a little bit earlier on, um, is really, really important. It's a key tool for us as marketers. We probably already use it at the moment, but we're probably not as aware of how powerful this tool can be because providing information in such a way as to exploit the emotional human decision-making process and steer it towards a desired conclusion is quite powerful for us to use. Why is it called framing? Well, it's because we're changing what is and what isn't included in the information by placing limits around it. And by doing that, you can actually manipulate the range of responses that are possible from the consumers. So in the same way that a newspaper might crop a picture to cut out all the stimulus from around the edge of the image and focus the observer on interpreting and reacting to solely what is within the frame, we can do the same in terms of framing our communications. Now, expectation is probably one of the most elusive decision traits of them all. Um, it's because expectation makes it possible for a positive outcome to actually be perceived as negative and vice versa. So what I mean by that is take a courier comp company, their key marketing message that they're putting out to influence a prospect's buying decision in their favour is 90% of deliveries within 48 hours. Sounds good, right? Actually, no. Because while it sounds good, 90%, 48 hours, by introducing these absolutes, you're much more likely to intrinsically disappoint because framing the message in this way highlights the fact that there are actually higher and better metrics possible. So what seems like and was obviously intended to be a positive message by the courier company that can actually result in a much more potentially negative buying decision. So in this example, the courier's marketers would have been much better to frame the message differently and state 99% of deliveries on time. Relatively simple change in the framing, but actually the effects of it are huge. It cuts down the potential for that violation of expectation. It's very difficult to argue with a near perfect metric like 99% or a much more categorical based statement. And what this does, it results in less disappointment and ensures that customers take away that positive message and obviously the positive buying decision as well. Thanks, Sarah. Well, we've talked about B2B marketing in general terms. We've looked at the principles, what cognitive marketing is, the theory and the science, but how can it be implemented to truly make a difference to your B2B marketing and deliver the results, which is what we're all after? We really need to look back at the core principles. So our motto here at BCM is to do B2B marketing properly or not at all. Um, and that really does mean going back to basics because ultimately they haven't changed, as we heard from Tim, um, you know, when Tim more or less founded B2B back in the 70s. STP, segmentation, targeting, positioning, for any marketers on this webinar today, I mean, it was drummed into us in university and on any SIM courses we, we may have taken. And you've only got to read columns in B2B marketing or marketing week publication to be convinced that this has to underpin any strategies that you might implement. But add cognitive marketing to the mix, truly understanding the audience, their decision-making biases, their wants, their needs, their challenges and pain points, and communicate and engage effectively with them based on that knowledge. That is what will reap results. But how do we implement it? Well, once you have a chosen strategy, I can't stress enough, you've got to do the research. Do not rely on tacit knowledge of your marketplace or audience because you'll invariably waste time and budget. And we've seen how many changes have happened even since the pandemic. In fact, um, Mark Ritson in an article not so long ago wrote that 5% of your marketing budget should actually be allocated to research. So don't just buy a database and hope for the best. Here at BCM, we are MarTech agnostic. So there are marketing technology platforms that we can advise you on that will help you to better understand that database and the relationship between buyers within that decision-making unit. But profiling and mapping out the buyer journey is really key to getting things right and having productive marketing. It's ultimately about solving customers' problems with your value proposition. So mapping out your key messages, using language and tone that resonates with your audience. And remember, within that DMU, there are multiple individuals, and it might be that you've got to communicate differently with different people in that decision-making unit. That is why research is such an important element. It really cannot be underestimated. 
the sexiest, the most creative marketing will ultimately fall on deaf ears or indeed the wrong the wrong ears entirely mm -hmm. if you don't get the research right. Tim mentioned about technology. Again, we can't stress enough, technology is an enabler. Um, it's not the strategy. So with the right marketing technology stack, you can research customers and communicate with them, but on a larger scale. But to date, there isn't one software that will do all that work for you. Um, sadly, if, if there were, we, we would be on that. Um, it does take legwork. You know, it takes desk research, calls, surveys, insight panels to get the right answers. But you, you must be sure that you're actually asking the right questions. And above all, it takes an integrated approach. So, you know, we hear about all these new tactics, but not one tactic will win the day. The journey from unaware through to buying, through to becoming an advocate of your brand takes on average a minimum of seven touch points. And that really is a minimum because in some more complex industries, it's a whole lot more than that. But ultimately, what we need to do is measure and measure correctly. Measuring the right metric is critical to understanding whether your cognitive marketing approach is working. As sales and marketing professionals on the webinar today, you know, we want a voice in the boardroom. In order to do that, we've got to be able to report convincingly. We've got to help our non-marketing colleagues become more marketing centric and more customer driven. Ultimately, it is all about the customer. Um, and simply put, that is what cognitive marketing is. Cognitive marketing is doing B2B marketing properly. So that in a nutshell is cognitive marketing. Um, and that concludes our, our presentations. I would like to open up the floor for any questions. Perhaps we can have a look. I don't think anything has come through in the chat. Maybe I can kick off with the, um, the question that was actually asked via email before we came yeah. online. Sadly, we, we had a few people drop off today due to illness and, and, and other reasons. But one question we actually had in advance of the webinar today was someone from the construction industry saying that they've got a really quite large database of around 10,000 contacts. You know, how, how do you do B2B cognitive marketing well with such a large database? Don't know if you want to jump in there, Tim. I know you've got some some strong views on on databases. Yeah, um, it depends whether what your definition of a database is. Um, what is this? Uh, what is this marketer got? Has he got a list of contacts? Um, because database software is crucial to being capturing your segmentation. And I always remember years ago we could never find the software that would give us um, a timeline segmentation as well as industrial sector, job function, share, wallet, all the other things and so on. And the only way you gather that information is by having a useful relationship and play ping pong with the audience, as I call it. You have to bounce back, forward, back, forward to gather data. And you have to be relevant to them. And your contact has to be useful. Because if you're providing useful contact to a design engineer or a maintenance engineer or a distributor of products, then they will engage in the relationship and they will provide you increasing data. And therefore, you reduce your database as you continue the ping pong until you've got everybody who is a genuine prospect for your products and their place within that decision-making unit. So that it would is, be my answer. Yeah, it is very much about filtering that database, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. getting it down to a manageable quantity. And, you know, realistically, you're not going to know the shoe size of, of every prospect that's in that database or, you know, what sports their children play, et cetera. But actually by bringing it down and taking a very targeted approach to that database, those cognitive marketing okay. principles can, can work for you to get that dialogue going um, and have those really meaningful conversations that lead to credibility, to lead to prospects working with you and gaining trust in you, your organization and your brand. Um, and that's where we see it working. 
I think if, we I have can, uh, if I can add uh, some things, I mean, clearly this is uh, way uh, outside my expertise, but in Eurosense, we are facing a similar problem with the database becoming bigger and bigger. And there is this idea that, you know, more data is always better than less. And in a way it's true, but uh, when you're talking about segmentation, it just reminds me an issue that we have that is just create some structure in this data, right? Because too much data on itself, you, that you can be swamped uh, uh, from that. Uh, an example I often give to my student because, you know, we're trying to model very complex behavior and we have data. And it reminds me always this the story from this Argentinian writer, uh, Borges, that um, um, tell this story of this emperor, is 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 a story where all a bit surreal that wanted the best map of the empire and asked all cartographers to go around and make the best map. And at one point, one cartographer came back and said, just I made the best map of the empire, is a map in which every point on the map corresponds on a point on the empire. But quickly they realized that now this map was as big as the empire and therefore completely useless. So in a way, if you do not have the right compression, then those models are never good to use. So knowing too much, even the shoe sides, it might just make it as complex as the things you are trying to model in the first place. So uh, it's not bad things that uh, the data are not the same sides of the thing you wanna study. What is really important is trying to find, segment this data in a way that they become useful for you. Just is, this is a very tangential in, insight from a very different area in which we still deal with big data. Thank you, Benedetta. We've had a question here saying that obviously where we talk about the DMU having seven contacts, that cognitive marketing is a basis for persona-based marketing. Um, and yet to a degree it is about personas, but actually it's drilling down further than just the group. Mm -hmm. So it is trying to get down to as granular a level as possible. Obviously with massive databases, the first step is to segment that, you know, geographically, by sector, you know, all the usual segmentation. And then within that group personas, but cognitive marketing does take it that step further where you are trying to get down to a far more granular level on an individual basis, wherever possible, um, by doing that ping and pong, by learning through every step of touch point, that little bit more information that you are logging against those individuals. Because as we say, within that decision-making unit, that DMU is one group, but the seven individuals on average within that, they will have very different um, decision-making biases, potentially. They will need to be communicated with um, differently. Their pain points, you know, whether you're a, a financial person or a marketer or sales or the business owner, you know, or or the tech, technical um, director, your, your communication style may need to differ the pain points and challenges of those individuals will be different. So it's really trying to be as granular as you can, um, hence the need for refining that database and bringing it down to a manageable amount where you can start building that cognitive knowledge. Any more questions from the chat? So cognitive augments persona based through the drilling down, is there a danger of elongating the sales process? Does this not alienate sales buy-in? One would argue that it should actually speed up that process because, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So if you're not going through those touch points with an individual um, in the right way, you, you potentially are losing prospects that you don't even know are there. We know that over 80% of the, the buying process is actually done online. Um, and so potentially have prospects out there that, that you're, not, you're not even aware of. With the cognitive piece, you are getting in front of those targets and you are having more meaningful conversations quicker. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, I would argue that it should shorten the timeline, but I appreciate your point as to are we adding complexity to this? I think it is complex anyway, um, and the, that complexity is needed to really get under the skin of those those potential buyers. Um, and as, as Tim um, mentioned earlier, 
creativity is actually the only thing really known to shorten that buying timeline. So you put creativity with the cognitive marketing layer um, and, and the research, you know, the research that goes into that cognitive piece together, mapping out that buying timeline, understanding where those prospects are on the timeline and you, you shorten, you shorten it with better results, I would argue. So it's not just about shortening the timeline, but it's about actual hit rate on, on conversion of those new sales. Um, we're obviously available. So please feel free to email myself, Miriam or Zara at bcmagency.co.uk. Um, you know, please do feel free to get in touch. I'd love to follow up with people after the webinar. Um, but, you you know, you can have a look on our website as well, bcmagency.co.uk. Um, and we have a white paper online. I'm happy to follow up with people on that as well. You may find that of interest having having listened to the webinar today. The recording will be made available, so we will follow up with everyone post-webinar. But thank you very much for your time today.